Hello, I'm Michael DiPietro from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm a pediatric radiologist and professor of radiology and of pediatrics at the University of Michigan. And today I'm going to talk to you about ultrasound and the evaluation of the brachial plexus in infants following uh, perinatal brachial plexopathy and the possibility of nerve repair. And this is specifically regarding uh, evaluation and uh, preoperative planning uh, for uh, nerve graft. This is work uh, doing with uh, my colleague, Dr. Yang, University of Michigan, who is a neurosurgeon and uh, is now performing all these surgeries. It's a very um, multidisciplinary uh, approach to these children, which includes uh, neurosurgery and radiology and sonography and orthotics and physical medicine and orthopedics and um, and anyhow we we th th there's a role now that sonography has and she has found it very very helpful it's a a little bit esoteric there aren't many places that actually have full-fledged programs of trying to re repair now these are children uh, at birth uh, difficult delivery, let's say traction on the neck, and uh, any of the cervical nerve roots uh, or any of the nerves of the brachial plexus uh, can be damaged. Uh, the damage can occur at multiple levels and it can occur at two sites. One is a root avulsion, which is within the spinal canal, and for that we do not evaluate with sonography. Actually, uh, I have a lot of experience looking at the cervical spinal canal and and under actually ideal co uh, conditions, I looked and could see roots, but it just was not reliable enough. And for that, we really rely on uh, MRI. Uh, but where sonography is useful is outside the spinal canal because they can be broken there. Now, some of these kids will have a, a brachial plexopathy um, of different degrees of extent, and they'll get better. Not, not the ones where the nerve is actually torn, but sometimes it's just been pulled, it's been injured, and they'll get better. But the approach that, that Dr. Yang and her team uses is that if the child is not improving and you're now at about three, four, five months of age, uh, the likelihood of a spontaneous uh, return of function then is, is not very good. So then she will, will evaluate these children for the possibility of doing a nerve graft. And, uh, and this is where, where we fit in a, a role we're kind of doing some reconnaissance. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at what portions of the brachial plexus we think are okay, which aren't, because what she'll do is, is take sural nerve out uh, down along the Achilles tendon and, and going up the leg, and then use that as material uh, to lay in basically a patch uh, go to go from a good nerve across a bad area to another good nerve, and therefore to try to restore some function. She says she can't make them normal but she can make them better. And that's uh, where, where we get involved with that. And it's kind of like an electrician uh, laying down a patch uh, with some wires or something like that. So this is our, our role. We want to make sure she's going to be able to go from viable proximal nerve to a viable distal nerve. Uh, what did she do before we got involved with sonography? Well, basically it was based on EMG and physical exam and that, but, but that was limited. and. Uh, and a lot of it was just figuring out while well, she's in there. But, uh, but she says, and we've done over 60 cases now, that actually the, the, the work that we've been doing in ultrasound uh, has actually been helping her. She has a better idea of what to expect, what she can maybe offer, what she can do. And uh, so we've continued. And it's been a, a great experience for us uh, because we're, we're learning quite a bit. Um, most of you that, that are, have gone through medical school remember the brachial plexus as something you, you took great pain to learn about and then promptly forgot the day after you took the test. So we had to go back to it. Now, we've come up with an approach uh, that's both a direct and indirect. And in the direct approach, we actually look at the nerves. And in a moment, I'll show you how we do that. Indirect is we look at specific muscles, knowing their innervation. That can tell us what's going on with those particular nerves. Go over that in a minute. Um, the brachial plexus is interesting as a numerical palindrome. You know, palindrome is a word that's the same whether you uh, pronounce it forwards or backwards. And uh, Dr. Yang pointed this out to me because we all start out with five roots. 
brachial plexus C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1, which then merge to become three trunks. So the five and six become the upper trunk, C7 stays by itself the middle trunk, C8 and T1 become the inferior trunk. So you go from five to three. Each of these trunks now divide into anterior and posterior divisions. That gives us six. Now by the divisions, we're getting uh, out here now into getting close by the clavicle. They then do uh, some merging, uh, which is a little more complicated to show here, but end up with three chords. And, and they're in relation to the subclavian artery. Now we're getting into the axillary region here. And, and this portion I don't sp really uh, evaluate uh, with, with regard to, to, to these studies. And then they then become the five uh, major nerves uh, of the arm by the way that they merge. So really we're concentrating on this portion up here with the roots coming out and then forming the trunks and, and the divisions. Uh, I really want to give credit to a, a friend and colleague in Genoa, Dr. Martin Oli. He's certainly well known to anyone who does musculoskeletal uh, ultrasound. Uh, Carlo has done a lot of wonderful work in many areas of musculoskeletal ultrasound, but really has in, uh, introduced most of us uh, to evaluating nerves. And it seems like every year he comes back and showing us in greater and greater and greater detail things he can see. But uh, first, uh, learned about uh, doing this. And then when the neurosurgeon found out that I, I knew a little bit or had a little experience or, or exposure looking at the nerves, then she inquired, you know, would we be able to help her with her studies? And this is how it all, how it all happened. So I told you we look at the nerves directly. Uh, because, although not part of the brachial plexus, the phrenic nerve uh, is also valued. We look at the diaphragm while the patient's breathing spontaneously uh, because it's, it's nearby and sometimes they can have a phrenic nerve injury. Uh, I have seen one at birth, but at the time that we're studying these kids uh, of the 60 cases, they've all had intact phrenic nerves. We look at the rhomboid muscle on the medial aspect of the uh, scapula because that's predominantly innervated just by C5. And, it, and it's the uh, dorsal scapula nerve, which comes off quite proximally. Therefore, if we see rhomboid atrophy, probably that proximal aspect of C5 is not going to be suitable as a jumping off point for a nerve graft. Uh, the serratus anterior muscle, also in relation to the scapula, but going anterior laterally to it, and I'll show you in a moment how we find them, is innervated by the long thoracic nerve, which comes off even more proximally on these roots, but it has three contributions. And uh, the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, not as useful, but we do look at it. And that's from the uh, suprascapular nerve, which comes off the, uh, the more uh, peripheral aspect of um, a C5 going, a C5 and 6 in, in the upper trunk. And then we also have been evaluating uh, the, the shoulder for laxity or uh, subluxation um, usually as, uh, late, later in the series because we also have an independent group of kids at an older age. We've been following them, so we're trying to see what they have even at this very, very early age. So the direct evaluation is looking at the brachial plexus. This is the work, again, that, that one of the pioneers is Dr. Martinoli. We're going to be looking at them uh, right there where they pass between the anterior and middle scalene muscles and the lateral aspect of the neck. So here's the kind of view we're going to take. Now, the tape is because this child is intubated. This child is asleep. So it does make the exam a lot easier. Uh, actually, just last week, I did one in an awake kid. And, and it was fine, but it, it's, it's a little bit harder because the kid's moving around. Why are they asleep? They're asleep because they've, they've just come out of MR looking at the, the, uh, the actual spinal cord and the roots, the intracanalicular portion. We keep them asleep for this portion and then also for brace fitting because orthotics comes too. So we, this is all done in the recovery room and it helps the exam go a lot faster. You can see here I'm using a small footprint high frequency transducer. I'm in the long axis to the neck. This is actually, uh, you know, basically to get this view that we're seeing here. And this is what you see. This is superior, inferior. You see the vertebral artery. The nerve roots are coming out. Now they're posterior to the artery. And then with some practice, now you can get pretty good at telling which one is which, but that's how we, we get started. Notice here, this is in short axis now. So you have anterior middle scalene muscles. Here they are coming out. And we're gonna scan in this way. 
And what do we see there? So here we are, how we would do the scan. And we look at it. Now, uh, the thyroid is over here. So this is on the right side. There's the anterior scalene muscle, the middle scalene muscle. And see how they line up like this, coming down. So this is probably C5, C6, C7, etc. cetera. And, uh, and, and you can see them as you move up and down them coming out. But this is what they look like. Nice, discrete uh, circles because the nerves are coming out at you and you, you end uh, between the anterior and middle scalene muscle. Here's one. We did anterior scalene, middle scalene, and again, we, we, when we're up high, we just see this one. We could see it coming from behind the, the uh, vertebral artery and then going into this space, and then this one joins it, and this one joins it. So we think we see that's five, six, seven. Maybe that's T1 that we're seeing here. And in some of them, you can actually see the little fascicles, which is how you identify nerves. And this is the orientation. So this is where the anterior scalene would be, the middle scalene, and you can see how this all works out. Now one of the things uh, we also do is follow it out towards the clavicle, and then you can see how your orientation will change a little bit as you're going out. And here you can see subclavian artery, and these are all nerves. These are all nerves there around the subclavian artery. Now I'm not trying to identify which is which. I'm really just going to be evaluating and just see in a moment how cleanly seen they are. Um, Going to the anatomy lab using a skeleton, there are some landmarks, and this is a, a feature, again, that Dr. Martinoli uh, has brought to our attention, is that by looking at the transverse processes, you can get an idea of where you are. And if you'll notice that the, uh, the, they're not all the same, like C5 looks like a U, and then C6 is a U, but has a big anterior process, which actually the neurosurgeons use as a... Uh, as, as, as actually it's over here, as a landmark um, when they're in the OR. And then when you get down to C7, it has a very small anterior process. And that's how we can do it. So, so here we are in, in short axis to the, um, to the neck. And I've shown in this diagram, uh, this just happens to be the anterior tubercle, posterior tubercle, vertebral artery. The nerve comes out behind it. And that's the orientation here. And in kids, it's a little more complicated because a lot of it is cartilage. So this is C5, anterior tubercle, posterior tubercle, cartilage in the bone. There's the vertebral artery. If you're not sure, put color on. And there's the nerve coming out from behind it. Then you move down a little bit, and you can see that the anterior tubercle on this one now is big. And that's called Chassagnac's tubercle. It's a landmark to the neurosurgeons when they're, when they're doing this uh, surgery but uh, you can actually see it. Here's the nerve. There's already one up here in, between, in the inner scalene area. Now this one's joining it, so that's probably six. Here's the posterior vertebral artery. You go down a little bit farther. Now there are a couple up here, see within the canal. There's probably like five and six already. Now this is C7 because you have a posterior tubercle, but no anterior tubercle, or it's minimal. So anterior scalene, middle scalene, and here they are lining up here. So using these landmarks, is, uh, is how you can kind of figure out where you are. You can also do it on the coronal. So here I'm showing, because C6 has that larger anterior process. And, and as you come more anteriorly, you can see it here. It really stands out. And then as you go a little bit posteriorly, staying coronal, you see the vertebral artery. And then a little bit more posterior, you see the nerves coming out. And again, the one with this one, is that's where the C6 nerve will be coming out. So that'll help you figure out uh, where you are. Now, as a teaching aid, it dawned on me when you look at the interscalene area, the normal it looks like a Ryan's belt. I mean, they're just nicely, clearly seen, um, you know, in the picture. And in a moment, when you see what the abnormal looks like, it look, uh, I call it the meatball. So this is normal. See the nerves lined up here. Now you may say, why are there so many black things? It's because these nerves are actually, uh, some of them are multifascicular. So that's actually like all of this may actually be C6, even though you see multiple black things here. But look at the abnormal side. You don't have any of this clarity anymore. These nerves are, are just all this big gamish of, of uh, thickened echogenic tissue. And that's why I call it the meatball. Sometimes it's quite big, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes you also see the nerve roots as they're coming out of the spinal canal 
are actually already thickened. So here's the vertebral artery, and they're a little hard to see, but they're thick and echogenic. And then you're getting in, and, and, and this is actually, the, this meatball is actually called the neuroma. It's not a neoplasm, it's just, it's really a scar. But that's the neuroma. And look at the normal side in contrast, that, you know, compared to these. At least, at least you see three, at least three roots here. And here they're all very echogenic and thick, right where they emanate from the canal. So, you know, disqualifiers for being any, any one of those nerve roots as being a jump off point for a nerve graft would be one, if the MR shows that that root is actually avulsed within the canal, then it, it's shot, it can't be used. Or if, if we're getting evidence that it's, it's damaged, either by its appearance, its involvement in the neuroma, or, or else indirectly uh, what muscles are involved. Here's a short axis view of the neck, the anterior scalene muscle, middle scalene muscle, thyroid would be over here, vertebral artery, nerve coming out, right where it comes out of the canal, it's all echogenic, and then it joins this big, the big meatball here, this huge neuroma that we're seeing. Now, one of the things that I try to figure out what roots are involved as best I can, also the neurosurgeon wants to know, does this neuroma extend all the way to the clavicle? Because it used to be that she didn't know that, and then she goes in and finds that it does, and she has to go further distally to hook up a nerve, and uh, then she has to extend her, her incision. So this way she knows up front uh, the length of the excision and the exposure that she needs. And this is what we see as we go towards the clavicle. Here's the subclavian artery. You can see there is a nerve here, but there's a lot of abnormal tissue here. This one looks like it may be, may be relatively spared. And on this coronal view, you have roots coming out. And look how this one, these are very, very thick right away. And we're probably seeing four roots right here. And here's another one, and then and it goes and joins this neuroma, a very big one. Now, this case is interesting because these upper roots are going and joining the neuroma, but this one seems to be spared right there. See, it looks intact as it goes underneath it. Okay, so we scan in this way. Uh, it, here's a, a recent case where we think it involved only C5 and C6 because this nerve looks pretty good on the short axis view. And then this is the normal for comparison where they all look normal. So in this case, you know, this one and this one are very thick and echogenic and part of the neuroma. This one down here looks, looks okay. So we thought that this is a, um, an, an upper trunk neuroma, which is C5 and C6. And then you want to follow it towards the clavicle. And this is more normal with nerve roots here. And this one, you can see some, but it's kind of echogenic. So that's what we look for. Another patient which really had only upper involvement. And you can see on the coronal view, looks actually pretty good coming out of the canal. And then it gets the neuroma here. So it is possible that you could have a normal, you could have a graft site for a jump off uh, very, very proximally. And the, uh, but these nerve roots here are, look like they're spared. So this is the kind of thing we're doing, we're trying to figure out. Now, the indirect evaluation is looking at the muscles. This is an idea that was really by a, a colleague, Dr. Coons, at, an emeritus professor with us now. And he suggested that we look at these muscles. So here's the rhomboid underneath the trapezius. And it's innervated by the uh, dorsal scapular nerve, which is all, very proximally off of C5. Now, we don't find that nerve or see that nerve, um, but we can infer by the condition of the rhomboid the condition of that portion of C5. So how do you find it? The, the kid's now prone. We're scanning across the back. You find the scapula. You go medial towards the spine, and the rhomboids are right here. An example, midline is right square down the middle. Same pictures with and without labels. Normal right side, left side. You find the scapula. Now being a kid, there's gonna be cartilage in the medial aspect of it. And this triangular structure here is the rhomboid muscle. And this is the normal side. We always do comparisons. There's the trapezius. Look on this side is that uh, it's, it's, you don't have that nice triangle. It's smaller, it's echogenic. So this kid has atrophy of the left rhomboid. So probably the proximal C5 is not uh, in good shape. Also looking at the serratus anterior, which is uh, more laterally coming around, it's underneath the latissimus dorsi. And that's innervated by the uh, long thoracic nerve, which comes off even more proximally, uh, but it has five, six, and seven. 
So if one of those is okay, uh, this radius might be all right. Here's how you find it. You find the scapula and you kind of go anterolaterally. And you can do it short axis to the body. You can do it long axis to the body. And in this case, I'm going to show it long axis to the body, which is actually short axis to the muscles. Now you can, you can and we have seen the long thoracic nerve, but uh, the, the business end that we're concerned about is way up in the neck, not down here. So here's what you see. This is on the normal side. Here's rib, which actually has a lot of cartilage in little kids. And here's the serratus muscle over it here, just like you're seeing here. And on this side, it's really thin and scrawny and atrophied. So we know that there's, uh, so five, six, and seven uh, approximately are not in good shape. Uh, we do look at the supraspinatus and infraspinatus from the, from the suprascapular nerve. This has a little bit more of a distal takeoff um, of, uh, on the, related to the upper trunk. Uh, it's, they're important muscles because uh, they're external rotators, and we find later on that kids who have uh, atrophy and, and uh, of those uh, are kind of permanently internally rotated because the, the internal rotators are unopposed. That's an unstable position, and the hip and, and the hip. Well, it is analogous to the hip, and the femur, I mean, <laughs> the humerus is uh, is displaced posteriorly and you see posterior subluxation or dislocation. So let me show you, uh, here's how we look at the supraninfraspinatus right there. In long axis, you're coming across. There's the sp supraspinatus, there's the spine of the scapula, here's the infraspinatus. You do it on the normal side, you do it on the involved side, you compare them for thickness, for echogenicity, to see if they may be atrophied. Another thing we've been looking at is um, looking at the shoulder for laxity. Now this is analogous to the developmental dysplasia of the hip in some ways. This is the normal side, the kid's prone. Here's the middle, uh, here's the uh, humeral head, here's the glenoid, and then look on the abnormal side, how it's displaced, uh, actually dislocated posteriorly. Uh, sometimes, now this happens to be a little bit of, a, this is an older kid where we look at him, but we, we, we've been doing it now in the babies, and actually I just had one last week that actually was like this at five months. But uh, sometimes it's in, but, but, but you compare the two sides, and on the abnormal side, there could be a lot more laxity. So that tells you there's going to be a, going to be a problem. So in summary, uh, we look at the nerves themselves. That's the direct approach. These are the qualities that we look for, the information we try to find out. We do the indirect approach, looking at the muscles, knowing these muscles specifically, looking for atrophy. And in putting all that together, that's just another part of the equation. Neurosurgeon puts it together with clinical data, neurological examination, et cetera, and then comes up with a plan. And she says, actually, it's been very useful. So we're really happy to be a part of this work. And thank you very much.